Welcome to another episode of Conic Detrimental. I am Dan Lust, joined this week for a special college sports edition of the podcast. Brendan Bell, our pre-law student extraordinaire at Auburn University, and Dan Green, a lawyer over at Newman and Lickstein. Today, we we kind of we haven't talked about college sports specifically in a while, so it's going to be a recap of a number of interesting stories in the field. I'm going to run through them really quick, and then we're going to jump right into it. So people have asked, uh, you know, if and when a federal NIL bill will happen. Uh, we do have some updates on that front. It's not by uh, lack of effort by certain politicians, as we continually have more bills, just not one uh, passed at this point. So uh, we're going to talk about that. Number two, we have some updates to the transfer portal window. Uh, if you're talking about NIL, you kind of have to talk about the transfer window. So uh, we're going to talk about some updates to that end that the NCAA has recently issued. Number three, uh, we're going to talk about uh, a story that maybe came across some radars, but a student, you know, it's maybe the pitfalls of the NIL era. Some promises that were made to certain athletes and, you know, and that's not everybody that strikes rich in that, in that portal. So Talk about that. College football playoff, the whole system is now changed. So talking about new money being added to, on the player side, uh, seemingly a very big change on the college football playoff structure, all kind of in the you know sports law, sports administration, uh, organizational arena. Time permitting, uh, we have a couple more stories, but let us uh, let's see if we can nail those for you. And then uh, we'll see. A reminder, our podcast is sponsored by Themis Bar Review, top bar prep company in the entire galaxy. If you are trying to find a place to take your bar prep, uh, I don't know how many times I can say it, but Themis truly is the best place. Everyone that we've referred obviously gets a, a special discount code, but all happy campers uh, for the people that we've sent over to Themis. Themisbar.com slash con detrimental. How's it going, guys? Brandon, Dan, how, how's it going on this lovely Thursday? It's good here in Syracuse. It's been raining all week, which I'm not complaining since it's uh, it's not snow. Snow should be coming soon. Plus, we have a 4-0 and football team here at the Dome, which is always exciting to rank top 25. And college hockey kicks off this weekend, Dan. I'm sure you know that Union kicks off their season. I believe it's at West Point in your neck of the woods. For yeah, you. 2014 Division One National Hockey Champions Union. They're probably uh, the smallest school to ever win a Division One championship, one of the four major sports. But uh, yeah, it's our it's our very famous uh, school. And and Brendan, probably a story for you off the pod, but you are now officially you've made up your mind. You are you are going to be matriculating to law school next year. That is the plan. I uh, already got some good news from a school that I'm very interested in. So uh, we'll let the application process go down. But just a, yeah, just another football season here in Auburn. We got a coach on the hot seat. We got a miracle win. So yeah, just another football season on the plains. So yeah, we have pre-law, we have law, we have lawyers, we got people talking sports on all shapes and sizes. So with that said, let us let's move to the federal bill action items. So Dan, I know you've been following this. Uh, so yeah, fill us in on, on what the latest is. Yeah, heading into year two of NIL here, on the legal front, things, you know, haven't been as hot and heavy or as hectic as it was in year one um, with states passing laws and then states further amending, repealing or suspending their laws. But we have seen some action here from the federal side regarding NIL laws. There's currently two sort of competing federal bills that have been introduced or reintroduced, one from the Democrats, one from Republicans. And as you probably expect, they're they're pretty different. The Democratic one, I believe that's been introduced by Cory Booker from New Jersey, um, along with some other senators. It's I think it's called the College Athletes Bill of Rights, and it really it acts more as a bill of rights in the sense that it covers more than NIL, you know, more athlete welfare and rights beyond just name, image, and likeness, where the Republican bill, I believe that was introduced by Senator Wicker from, I believe, Mississippi. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, That's more focused towards NIL and is very much NCAA friendly. This bill gives antitrust protection to the NCAA in, in two ways, the proposal at least does. It prohibits former athletes from suing for retroactive NIL, which is basically the focus of the House versus NCAA case right now that's going on. And it um, also says that college athletes should not be considered employees, which is the subject of the Johnson v. NCAA case. Um, I believe that's in Pennsylvania. Right now, I think this, there's probably almost 10 federal bills that have been introduced on NIL, and none of them really have gone anywhere. So it remains to be seen if these pick up any traction. What's funny is like, I uh, was talking to someone, Dan, I'm sure, you know, you're getting the same calls like, hey, we're a year into NIL. I want to, the reporters want to write like a year recap piece. And they, I explain what's, you know, at least, at least my vantage point, you know, no one wants to step up and be the authoritative, you know, authoritative voice in the room and help 
enforce different issues and kind of create those, you know, very clear lines of demarcation. And they, they go, what's the solution? And I'm like, you know, either you're okay living in some shades of chaos or right. The, the the solution that seemingly the conference commissioners want and the NCA wants is a federal bill. It's just the problem. uh, Maybe it's the paradox of choice. Maybe there are too many bills out there. I don't really know exactly what, what the holdup is, but if the conference commissioners want it, you know, and the NCA wants it, and I think, you know, there's a decent chunk of sports fans. I don't know if it's the majority, but a decent amount of people want this federal bill. I'm, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. Do you have any sense of timing, Dan? I have no sense of timing. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. There's been, as we've noted, there's been a few bills that have been introduced. I don't think they've even made any sort of progress or any sort of movement at all. I mean, just like anything that has to do with the federal government, as we know, you know, issues are divided between the parties. I think there's some hold, there's some catch up here with the Democratic proposed bill because it covers more than NIL. And I think on the other side, the Republican bill might be getting some pushback because it might be too friendly towards the NCAA. We'll see what if anything comes through and if anything moves forward. But as I think I've noted before, maybe previously on the pod, that the federal government also has a lot of other bigger issues to handle than um, maybe this issue as well. But I think most people involved in the space would like some sort of uniformity uh, one way or the other. Yeah. And, and just if we haven't said on this, I think the reason, uh, Dan, you and I are, are talking about a federal bill and why there seems to be some groundswell of support for it. Right. The the NCAA does not control all sports. It has maybe some more oversight over the non-football sports just because they're, they're more actively involved, which Brendan will talk about the divided power once we get to the college football playoff stuff. But, yeah, if you have a federal bill, uh, again, it's the old axiom, right? Twenty one uh, is the drinking age in every one of our 50 states in the country. So whether that's right, whether that's wrong. Uh, you have to be 21 to drink. So maybe the, the right law should say you have to be 18. But at some point, somebody on the federal level picked 21, and that was a federal law. So any other state that said 18 or 19 or 20 or 22, it didn't matter anymore as 21. So a federal bill coming in would basically eliminate all of these you know, variations between states that have it, that, that don't have NIL laws, that do have it, that some are restrictive, some are not. So you know, I, I imagine that there will be a lot of complaints when a federal NIL bill is passed but, you know, it's at least some form of clarity. So if you are a college football purist, which I, I know many, they don't like that money is being factored into why a kid picks a certain school. It used to be right playing time, prestige of the school, winning program, all that fun stuff. And, you know, there's another sect of our population that says, why shouldn't money be the number one consideration if it is for NFL free agents and NBA free agents? So, you know, I, I think the my at least my sentiment is that if money is going to be involved, it should be the same playing rules for every state. And if the athlete gets paid seven figures, so be it. But every school should be able to offer that same amount of money to the extent that they can afford it. And not some that are scared to violate the law. Some don't know where the line is. Some feel more comfortable than others getting close to that line. Brendan, do you have anything to add on this? Speaking on the like the various amounts of bills that, you know, have been, you know, talked about, um, one actually came has come from Tommy Tuberville, who is a former Auburn head coach, former uh, Texas Tech, Cincinnati and Ole Miss head coach, who actually was in the coaching business and has friends, obviously, in the in the in the business who are currently lamenting on, you know, the idea of recruiting is completely different now. You know, it's not all about fit and, you know, the scheme the player wants in the school. It's about, you know, who, which school can, you know, give me the most money. And will it eventually come to pass? Probably not. Um, there's, like you said, there's so many deals out there, but it just kind of goes to show that there are people, you know, in Congress and in the, in the Senate that are, are working towards this, but, you know, getting down to one rule that'll eventually, one like NIL law that'll eventually govern college sports is definitely a, a situation where, you know, a lot has to happen. I guess, Dan, before we, before we move on, I mean, we had a lot of different bills. Some are pro NCA, some are, are not. Do we have any of your own observation as to what this bill most likely will in, encompass? Or you're just, you know, you're just following these bills coming out? I'm not optimistic that anything's going to happen on the federal level anytime soon. Um, and going back to your point about all the the Patrick and different state laws, it's kind of funny to think about high school athletes trying to, you know, and their parents or representatives or whoever are doing legal analysis based on which state provides them the best opportunity to get NIL deals. It's kind of weird. And really, state law really shouldn't be playing that much role in uh, into recruiting. It's just uniformity is preferred, but it really remains to be seen how that really occurs. And I mean, that's for us on the legal side. I mean, I get a lot of calls and Dan, you and I are, I'm licensed in New York. You licensed anywhere else other than New York? Just New York. 
Yeah, I get I get calls from people to like, hey, uh, you know, I, I might have a potential deal in Florida. And I'm like, well, I know someone for you in Florida. I can send you a name, but like I could just give you some general advice. Here's some educational advice. But for us as pra- you know, practitioners, there's never been a time where I had to understand the laws of I don't know, more than like a handful of states, maybe New York, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, like my, my neighboring states. But this NIL era, you kind of if you want to fashion yourself as being an, an NIL aficionado, you have to be dangerous in a number of these different states, which I don't, I don't necessarily think is conducive to being a particular expert in the field. If you have to know all these different state laws at the same time, whereas if there's a federal law, you could have, uh, you know, a number of people that are familiar with one law as opposed to, I don't know, 15, 20 different ones, which, you know, Dan, you and I do for fun. Um, but I don't, I, I think it's probably a, a safer and healthier landscape if there's one bill and, you know, um, we can just work on that one. So, um, at least my thoughts there. Guys, anything to add before we move on to our next topic? Brendan, Dan? There was a revision to the IRS code that came out this week. I, mean, I think it was even yesterday about taking aim at collectives, specifically those ones that have received 501c3 status or is applying for it you know, for, for charitable purpose to, purposes to get tax deductions. I think maybe a big holdup here at the federal level or even just at any level regarding NIL Um, is about collectives. There seems to be a great fear um, about the role that they're playing in recruiting. Um, And I think as Brendan mentioned, like the Tupperville, he was was asking for information about NIL and collectives. And it seems just from based on that letter that was sent out, I believe recently, collective seems to be the hot button issue for those that are regulating this this industry. Um, So it'll be really interesting to see how the law, um, if it affects how collectives are run and operated. You know, at least in my private practice, I spoke with a a number of school officials last week who are a lot of questions about the collective space. And I'm meeting with, without getting into too many details, I'm getting with an athletic director who just wants more information on, on where these next trends are. So, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in the college sports space and you have friends that are on the compliance level or NIL coordinator, or even, you know, um, you know, maybe even a coach for one of these teams, like, they could use some advice right now. I don't really think we know what the landscape's going to look like. And I, Dan, and Dan, I think you and I spoke about this offline. I have um, law firm friends that work on the collective side, and they're not confident that the collective field is going to exist. For, let's say we'll put a number at like five, 10 years, right? Because um, in theory, right, Dan, where is the money coming to the, to the collectives? It's coming from wealthy donors who probably were once upon a time giving that money to the schools. And now they're just, instead of giving it to the schools, they're putting it in this collective and the collective is spending money. I'm going to put this in quotes on behalf of the schools or to, to support the schools in some way, but you have this unholy alliance because some state laws say that the collectives should not be communicating with the schools and, and vice versa. So that maybe the cleanest way to clean up the space or one, one way to clean that up is to say the collectives, right. You know, and I, I think they would cease to exist the second the school is allowed to pay the athletes. So, you know, it's, we're in a lot of turmoil here and I'm not necessarily wishing uh, ill upon the collectives. I'm just pointing out that I don't know how, how confident I would be to bet that they'd exist, you know, in five, 10 years. It's just, it's just an odd business uh, organization. Yeah. They're kind of living in a gray area right now. Like, it, I mean, once NIL is permitted and college athletics you kind of saw it coming. I think it, one of the first collectives or if not the first was the Gator Collective, right, right in, right in the early wake of July 1st, um, Collectives have kind of become like a, like a necessary evil. Um, I, I think somebody said that. I don't know if I would call it that. But um, where fans of certain schools are, if their schools don't have a collective, they're kind of like, what's going on? Why don't we have a collective? And it's kind of become necessary as a part of recruiting and retaining talent on campus. The interesting thing about a lot of these collectives that are coming out that are for charitable purposes, 501c3 status, is we all know what, what it's for. It's for as we said, recruiting, retaining talent. So I think a lot of these collectives that are trying to promote themselves that way need to be careful with their messaging. I think there's a big difference between saying we're going to pay athletes to do charitable works to like, you know, to support us, uh, the, um, the athletics department and it's our athletes. And another difference between saying, Hey, we want to help charities and, lo- and local causes. And the best way to do that is probably through these, local college athletes who have great followings and are able to promote this the best way. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to follow the collective landscape, especially the 501c3s in the coming months and year or two. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good place to, to, 
to end it. I mean, obviously you keep, keep tabs on the bills, but if and when that happens, it's going to have ramifications across the player space, the collective space, the merch space, the litigation space. So federal bills are a very, very big domino. Kind of part and parcel with the NIL conversation. You know, I think if people were coming in new to the field, like NIL is one animal, but the fact that NIL was created, or I want to say created, but this dawn of the July 1st era was uh, brought upon right at the same time that this one-time transfer rule was allowed, kind of was a perfect storm. So um, maybe, right, in the old days, like, you, I, I haven't actually seen the transfer numbers, but I imagine it was probably exponentially more guys and gals that transferred this past year than have ever transferred before. And that's because, in theory, you'd be open to a payday by moving to a new school. Uh, and then if you transfer again, a payday to that school, or maybe a payday to remain at a particular school. So inserting yourself in the transfer window basically told people it was like, if you go on LinkedIn, you know, when you have that green circle, it's just like open to network. This is like open to get paid. It's like a green circle around your little face over here. So yeah, so the NCAA has been working on adjustments to the window, what they were going to do, how they were going to change the transfer rules. Uh, and Brendan, uh, we do have an update on that front. So why don't, you, why don't you fill us in over here? Exactly. You cannot talk about the transfer portal without talking about NIL. And uh, the fact that these two things, the one-time transfer rule and NIL rights came into effect pretty much at the same time, has created a whole bunch of chaos in terms of roster management. You have players leaving um, from smaller schools to big schools, uh, other way around too, if they're not getting playing time. And a common sentiment many coaches have had is like, there is free agency in college athletics right now, especially college football, college basketball, where the money is pretty big on the NIL front. We've seen schools like Miami uh, be able to pluck players from, you know, smaller schools, even big schools to come play for them. And, uh, you know, many have expressed a desire to play some level of limitations. Obviously, you can't do too much because you're going to get uh, sued in court if you try to limit college athletes too much. So uh, there's kind of a fine balance between that. Um, they have uh, the NCAA recently passed legislation regarding transfer windows, which I have written an article in the past for the site about the desire and an encouragement to do this, because I do believe it is best not only for the, the coaches, but it's also best for the student athletes in terms of academics and also playing time and and roster certainty for their part, too. So for fall sports, there will be a 45-day window beginning after the championship selections are made to where they can transfer, and also a little bit of a window, a two-week window from May 1st to May 15th after spring ball. So if things aren't going well after spring practice, they also have another out. So it's kind of a 45-day window after the season and then a two-week window following spring ball. For winter sports like basketball, um, they have a 60-day window beginning after championship selections are made. No other window than that, just the two-month period after the season is over in March and April. And then and for spring sports, baseball, softball, uh, tennis, all of those sports, there is a 45-day window after the end of the season, after championship selections are made. And also a bit of a window uh, from December 1st to December 15th at the midpoint of the semester um, to transfer as well. So I believe this is a good thing for college athletics. They also discussed briefly, uh, there was some bit of a uh, a hint that they would eliminate the one-time transfer and just allow unlimited transfers. That did not ultimately come to pass. And that was when that kind of news leaked, a lot of people had, uh, you know, a disliking to that. Um, but for now, uh, we have windows. What was the sentiment? People wanted an unlimited transfer rule or did not want that? Many in college athletics did not want that because that would only add to the chaos. So you could essentially go from school to school to school right. in a three-year span. And that's just, you know, that, that that might be good for the athlete, but for, you know, in terms of his career, like making the pros and stuff like that, going from, you know, a Mac school to an SEC school. But, you know, academically transferring multiple times is some, not something that would lead to a desirable outcomes from a graduation standpoint. As I was stating, the transfer windows do not apply to graduate students or otherwise known as grad transfers. So people who have students who have already graduated, they can transfer whenever they want. But for the students uh, still in still in their four years of undergrad have to follow the transfer windows. I saw that. And I mean, when I saw the unlimited transfer rule, I was thinking, I'm like, that would be really progressive of the NCAA. That does not seem like right. it would right. normally do. But you know, I uh, like if my, my mind goes to like LeBron, who had a series of like one year contracts in, in basketball and really it's very hard for the Cavs to build out some long term success. The Cleveland Cavaliers when LeBron wasn't committing long term. So that's uh, I would think the sentiment. Then I may be a question for Dan, you and you and Brendan together while we're on, on the transfer topic. Um, I don't think we've talked about either of these two guys on the show, at least recently. Miles Brennan, the former quarterback at LSU 
and Spencer Rattler, the former quarterback at Oklahoma, now the quarterback at South Carolina. Both of those guys, quarterbacks at, at very big programs, signed lucrative NIL deals. Spencer Rattler signed deals when he was with Oklahoma, signed local Oklahoma deals. And when he transferred to South Carolina, because of these prohibitions, you're not really allowed to tie uh, compensation to performance, which uh, it's, a, it's a very vague term. Whether someone is benched, I'm not sure if that's performance. Whether someone's transferred, I'm not sure if that constitutes like quote unquote performance. Um, but for Rattler, he had deals that were pre-existing with Oklahoma, he transferred to South Carolina, and those deals did not automatically terminate. I spoke to someone in Oklahoma who told me that Spencer returned, I guess, some cars from the car dealership. But there's seemingly a hole there, right? If Spencer Rattler could have, I think, enforced those for longer because you cannot, there's really no mechanism for these local businesses to end those deals when an athlete transfers. Now, probably more problematic is the Miles Brennan issue, right? Miles Brennan was the quarterback at LSU, signs these deals. He gets injured, and then he says, I'm going to retire from football. I, you know, if an athlete retired from, uh, you know, the pros, um, I would think that his professional contract would not pay him, right, unless there was some crazy insurance clause or something like that. But by nature of the fact that he's not getting paid by his university, getting paid by these separate sponsors, and you can't tie a compensation to performance, Brennan is still getting paid out on these NIL deals. He doesn't have to pay it back. So I don't know, Dan, I mean, you're, you're an attorney that, that, you know, does some deals in the space. I mean, isn't that unfair to the businesses? Isn't that like kind of to, too pro athlete? I mean, I don't, I don't know. No, I, I honestly don't think so. Um, as you said, you know, the rules prohibit um, compensation based on performance and enrollment at a specific institution. And when you're contracting with an athlete, an influencer, celebrity, whoever, you're, you're paying them for who, for who they are. Um, anything could happen to somebody the next day or down down the line. That's why it's super important, especially with what I do here um, at my firm, is contracts. It's really important to have, you know, negotiate certain terms regarding the term of the contract and certain ins and outs and for each party. Miles, like, you know, Miles Brennan was slated to be the starting quarterback and he retired. Like, what if he got hurt? Or what if the backup quarterback came in and was, you know, was amazing and Brennan, Brennan um, sits the ride to the bench the whole year. That happens all the time. You know, brands at the same time, they're sometimes they're looking for diamonds in the rough too. And they take a chance on somebody who is currently the backup point guard or quarterback and give them a deal in the hopes that that person elevates their game and becomes huge at a, at a deal that's more favorable to the brand. We even see that at the pro level with players that are drafted in the first round of the NBA, the NFL, brands sign these lucrative deals with these players, it's not guaranteed that they're going to be any good or remain healthy. It serves as a warning to all parties involved as well that there are certain risks involved, but I think that's just a part of the game. While we're on that, uh, let's stick with the story, Dan, that you um, you put on my radar and, you know, we've been talking about uh, offline. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily always work out for the athlete. So sometimes you'll have these seven-figure payments. And sometimes there's reported eight, eight-figure payments, as crazy as it can sound. But then there's the other side of the coin. So, Dan, I'll, I'll let you tell it. I, I have some uh, personal thoughts on it as well, but I'll let you kind of lay, lay the battlefield here. So what's going on with you know this, this athlete uh, moving to, to California? It's, it seems kind of like a messy story. Yeah, you're referring to the T.A. Cunningham story, which is serves as a lesson for other athletes. And it's also just an unfortunate story, um, which ha- which turns out to have a pretty OK ending. The, the short of it is that T.A. Cunningham is a very high level five star prospect who's been living in Georgia, playing high school football in Georgia. The story is that his family got evicted um, from their home in Georgia and that they were they moved to California um, on the front of the premise that, you know, he'll be able to play football there and, um, you know, get some NIL deals and, feel, and you know, his family would be comfortable. Um, in Georgia, the High School Athletic Association does not allow um, its athletes to receive NIL compensation while California does. Um, and what turned out here was that once he moved to, to California, he was ruled ineligible to play by the, uh, the California High School Athletic Association, I, um, I think it's called the CIF, first for not having the, um, re- reaching a certain standards for eligibility for as a homeless student, I believe, and then and then um, going for, see if there's any undue influence for him to go to that high, the certain high school in California 
Um, it turned into a kind of like a he said, she said type situation between attorneys and um, an agent who is now in big trouble with the law. Um, and Cunningham, unfortunately, had to sit out, um, I believe it was four or five games, but has now been ruled eligible, which makes me happy. Um, at the end of the day, these kids just want to play football or whatever sport that they love, um, get recruited. You know, their future, they, they, they just want to play. They just want to play the game. And it serves as a reminder that, you know, you got to trust the certain people um, that are putting your athletic eligibility and your life in, in their hands. And um, I'm just glad Cunningham, Cunningham's able to get in the field. I hope he gets recruited and goes to the school that he wants to go to. Yeah, um, you know, so it's certainly a good breakdown. And, you know, there is a somewhat of a happy, I'll say happy ending, but uh, a, a better resolution to the story that Cunningham's seemingly now able to play and he's eligible um, you know, the part of the story that uh, I, I never like, and I, I always feel uncomfortable um, when attorneys, uh, you know, are fighting in the space. I don't think it looks good for us as a legal practice, but uh, two names came up in that, in that litigation. It's uh, Michael Caspino, who we talked about on the show before, and then uh, Darren Heitner, who's, you know, uh, been on our show a bunch of times. So I consider Darren a friend. So these two guys had a very public kind of Twitter war kind of back and forth. And you know, that uh, dispute has now seemingly moved over to like legal papers. And um, so I, I just don't, I don't like see it. Uh, I I have friends that practice, you know, representing attorneys, suing other attorneys. I just, I just don't like, uh, I just don't like that, that side of it, but obviously it's a competitive space. And I I feel like that's, that's maybe part of this, that two people are, you know, very, both very big names in the NIL spaces in their, in their own right, uh, whatever the top 20 list of influential people that came out. I think they were both on it, but yeah, I, I, uh, I guess my little PSA to people, just because it appears in the complaint or a petition of a lawsuit doesn't mean that it's true. Um, and that's going to be the burden of the case to, to show certain things. Neither Michael or Darren is named as a party in the lawsuit, but yeah, I just put the PSA out there just because you see it in a complaint doesn't mean it's true until a jury actually finds that or a judge actually finds it. It's usually, and it, which happens guys on like less than 1% of cases where there's actual determination on the merits of the case. Most of the time, right, uh, there'll be some type of settlement or in theory, you could get a case dismissed on the papers, but people can make their own assessments. But just because, again, something appears in a petition, which are sworn allegations, doesn't actually mean it's true. It's just someone's version and perception of events. Brandon, they'll teach you that in the first day of law school. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good lesson. Looking forward to it. It's unfortunate that that's become a part of the story where I think part of the story that's getting overlooked is how certain states allow high school athletes to receive NIL compensation. Some don't. And that's creating recruiting wars between the states. And we've seen athletes move from, from one state to another to pursue NIL deals. Um, I think we saw was a, was a, I think her name is Jada Williams from Missouri high school women's basketball player moved to California for that reason, where at the end of the day, it's the same, same argument that people said at the college level. You should, why, why do these specific group of people do not have the right of publicity? Um, and I think we're, and we've seen a lot of states start permitting um, NIL at the high school level. And I think we're going to see it moving forward. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if every state permits it, you know, within the next few years. Yeah, um, I think that's, I mean, honestly, you, you, you've said it well. Uh, we'll see, Dan, if the federal NIL bill also encompasses these demarcations between college and high school sports and within the same state, which I think are very odd. Um, you know, we'll see, but there's, there's certainly a lot of work to be done. And, you know, what this lawsuit outlines, just like we could talk about Quinn Ewers over at Texas, who was Texas, then he went to Ohio and then he came back to Texas. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And if we're really, if we want to get athletes paid, that's one thing, but to make athletes, Dan, to the point that you raised earlier, transfer four times to make as much money as possible. That's not conducive to anything. It's not conducive to a good football product. It's not conducive to a good uh, program or to the athlete's development. If he has like, you know, we could talk about, uh, you guys know I'm a uh, New York Giants. Uh, you know, I watch, watch the games. I used to work for them. Yeah, Daniel Jones has worked in like four different uh, offensive systems in like four years. So it's not conducive to success when things keep changing. So you have as most talent, you know, as much talent as you want. If you're transferring two, three times uh, during your collegiate career, that cannot be a, a model for, you know, uh, individual growth uh, and also just athletic growth. So just, I think the science kind of bears that out, but yeah, I, I, I'm happy to be on the controversial side if it is, but I, I'm very much in support of a all encompassing federal bill, but sooner rather than later. I know uh, Dan, I've, uh, I've told you this story. 
I was on a panel with someone and I said, we should get a federal bill. And this person who is a, a lawyer at a big firm uh, said, why do we want a federal bill? And I'm like, because that would uh, ease the chaos that is concerning, concerning across the college landscape. And he goes, well, free market capitalism, let things be crazy. Why does there need to be a federal bill? So I, you know, people that, that can make that point, Dan, where, Dan Brennan, where do you guys fall on, on that side of the equation? Do we want a federal bill? I, I think it solves a lot of issues, but maybe that's just me. I, I'm more with you. I, I like where there's rules. Um, I do understand that, uh, you know, it's the free market, you know, you don't want to limit rights, but I think one day we're going to get you know, college football, college basketball players paid. Uh, by the schools um so that will obviously soothe that but soothe that issue but uh i i am for rules that you know everyone has to follow where it's not just one state versus another so i'm more with you but i do understand the other side as well i kind of go back and forth on it i've kind of started being of the school of thought that there's really no need for states to have nil laws the ncaa allows it and it creates confusion and creates competition um just the base through law. Um, federal law, it would be good, it would be good for uniformity. It would also depend what came with it. As you said, there's each competing par- party wants certain things involved or included in that bill. And I think I would I would have to make my opinion based on what else was in there as well. We'll see. I mean, the more, the more we want an all-encompassing federal bill, the longer it's going to take. Um, but if it's going to be done, it's got to be done the right way. So Okay, let's move over while we have some time remaining. In the middle of all this, we've been saying this for about a year, like the college sports landscape is fundamentally changing. Uh, There's something new kind of every day. Um, One that has been a debate, uh, forefront of debate ever since, you know, when I I was uh, growing up, they had the BCS system and now they moved to the college football playoff system and now uh, some uh, expansion, which uh, was very highly contested. So, uh, Brendan, college football is our biggest moneymaker in sports. That's where a lot of our sports law cases lie, the, at least the most uh, high profile issues and sports business issues. And again, like we could talk about the Austin versus NCAA case, uh, college football player that was at the heart of us and then college basketball with Ed O'Bannon. So um, I think, uh, yeah, college football is, is very important to our sports business, sports law uh, issues. So yeah, if there's a big change to the money at the top of college football. We do have to follow it here. So Brendan, what is the latest on the college football playoff front? So in the last few weeks, uh, the playoff has announced that the playoff will be expanding from four to 12 teams no later than 2026. And I'll get to whether uh, we see it before then or not. But this plan, this this 12-team playoff, was originally leaked to the public back in the summer of 2021 and had a lot of momentum um, until the news that Texas and Oklahoma were leaving the Big 12 for the SEC, which caused all hell to break loose. Uh, We saw the infamous alliance where there was, you know, no contract. Uh, formed and obviously that ended up not working as Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren ended up stabbing George Klyovkov, the Pac-12 Commissioner, in the back by taking his two biggest brands. Uh, but the alliance was good for one thing. It did delay playoff expansion. We often talk about how conference commissioners are the most powerful people in college athletics these days. And while I do think they are much more powerful than Mark Emmert or any NCA president will ever be, uh, it was the university presidents who ultimately got this uh, over the finish line uh, to eventually expand to 12. Um, but the details on like the particulars uh, have not been figured out yet. And event, like there is desire to get the playoff expanded by 2024, or 2025, which would be early. Uh, there are still a lot uh, of issues still in play. Um, it is worth mentioning that of the 12 bids that will go to the, the teams in the new playoffs, six will be reserved for the highest ranked conference champions. Um, so that could be uh, obviously the power five as we know it right now. And additionally, one other group of five conference, but it also could be two group of five conferences if they are higher ranked than say a PAC 12 team or a big 12 team. I think this is great for the overall health of college football. Only 13 teams have made the four team college football playoff since it was formed in 2014. I think I read the number, if this was in place back in 2014, the number of teams that would have made it is over 40. So having more teams uh, feel in fans, feeling like they have a chance and a path and access to the playoff is I think is good for, you know, over uh, balancing the recruiting and uh, just making uh, everyone feel like they have a chance to win the championship and keeping the regular season games that uh, don't involve like top five teams important down the stretch. Um, As far as the issues that still, are hovering over whether this thing can be expanded early or not. Um, a lot of it comes down to revenue sharing 
and ticket allocations for first round games. Uh, there, people are not sure at this moment whether those those first round playoff games we played on campuses or at bowl games. Bowl games still want a place in the new uh, college football postseason, so that's that's a battle that still hasn't yet to be uh, determined yet. And also uh, scheduling, uh, scheduling hotels in these small college towns, playing these games in you know cold weather, you know winter climates and in December where it could be negative degrees in Madison, Wisconsin or Ohio State or places like that. And also balancing the schedule versus NFL games because that's obviously when the NFL playoffs are going on. So there's still a lot of issues that need to be resolved here by the conference commissioners. The president's kind of got this through but left the the grunt work to the commissioners. So uh, um, a lot of people want it early. Um, Obviously, 2024, 2025 is when USC – UCLA, Texas, no, you will all join their new conferences. So it's kind of like a reset of college football that people want, but there is still a lot to be determined. Also, on the topic of revenue sharing, I've kind of hinted at this early. Do players get a share of this, you know, newfound billion dollar expanded college football playoff like we see in professional sports where players get compensated as they can they go through the rounds, get more money as you go through the second, third, fourth round, all that stuff. That could be in play as uh, many believe this is going to be worth an additional 1.5 to 2 billion dollars obviously the we saw the big 10 tv deal um obviously all, all this stuff is just pushing more and more towards the, the the movement towards player pay so these are all issues that are still being determined and need to be resolved sometime and i think they're meeting next in october to determine whether this thing can be expanded early but uh all in all we're moving closer towards a an environment where everyone feels like they have a chance to make the make the playoff uh, whether or not this changes the teams that actually win the, the national championship is probably not going to change you're still going to see your powerhouse programs win it all I'll, I'll jump in here i mean i i think where this is important dan green you mentioned this potential uh this case that's going on now johnson versus nca we i don't think we've covered it at length on the pod but you know the question uh and there's the other case house versus nca which we haven't discussed what exactly nil is meant to cover because if you're a pro player right the further you go in your postseason, you get additional game checks. You make more money uh, from the school, and obviously, or from your from your employer. But I don't know for March Madness purposes, right? Like if you advance in the tournament, obviously the school is benefiting tremendously from that. But it's not like you're getting paid some particular game check. So yeah, I mean, if you're really trying to get into this college sports space, it's not enough to know just about like the legal side and studying the federal bills. It's understanding you know this where the television money is going, right? And also, you should kind of know like. The, the money, right? We, we, Brandon, I think you and I spoke about it in a previous episode, but Big Ten's getting like $7 billion. The big f- football is big business. So for years, these schools and and even some, I think now are claiming pro- like poverty that they can't afford to pay. They can't afford this, right? That the That's why these collectives are important. And, you know, I don't think that maybe they're not saying the quiet part out loud, but yeah, college football, to, to the surprise of no one, is huge, huge business. And this is a decision, you know, motivated by money. And the other one, Brandon, that you alluded to, right? Conference realignment, another big legal issue that we've covered plenty of times in the show. And a lot of that is motivated by the old college football system, which was, you know, I think prior to Cincinnati, no non-Power 5 school had made the college football playoffs in however many years it's been going on. So, yeah, I think this is an alleviation. The fact that you're not going from four uh, and expanding that out, maybe there's less pressure on schools to migrate to the top, to that Power 5 if you can have a school like a Cincinnati that doesn't need to go undefeated, you know, to, to get there. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Dan, do we have an expectation of Syracuse making the, uh, the expanded playoffs at some point soon? I sure hope so. I'm not a betting man, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's nice to be, it's nice to be in the top 25 and have an undefeated team. We'll, we'll see what happens when they get into the meat of that ACC schedule this year. Let's see, let's see if they're for real or not. You're the only person uh, on this podcast that thinks that, but uh, Brandon's not going to say it. Okay, uh, I think we have enough time to just some more interesting issues on in, in the, we'll see, closer to the legal, pure legal space. Memphis basketball investigated once upon a time for the James Wiseman stuff. Penny Hardaway is the, the coach over there, former uh, top pick in the NBA draft. Was building, uh, was slash is, it's kind of building something special at Memphis but that's uh, until the sanctions come in. So, Brendan, what are we hearing on that front? Yeah, so Memphis basketball received great news this past week when they avoided any postseason ban, any scholarship reduction from the whole James Wiseman eligibility issue. Uh, So back in November of 2019, we all know these NCAA investigations take a long time. Uh, Memphis played him in defiance of the NCAA after they had ruled him ineligible because Penny Hardaway, who was uh, Wiseman's former AAU and high school coach, had paid 
his moving expenses to uh, to Memphis from Nashville. Um, and the NCA was not uh, was, you know, incurious and they held him ineligible. Uh, Memphis did play him in one game and many believe that this would lead to a significant punishment. However, Memphis lawyers did a great job in their case, in this case of arguing that Penny Hardaway had been, you know, philanthropic and philanthropic throughout his uh, throughout his post playing career, donating a lot of money to needy families in Memphis. And they they argued successfully that this was just another example of him being a nice person, being generous. And Penny Hardaway is no different than his, the rest of his um, philanthropic uh, pursuits. And they also successfully argued that Hardaway did not know that uh, uh, that Wiseman was ineligible before he played. Um, so many believe that Memphis uh, got off got off pretty easy here and did not face any postseason ban as many college basketball teams are going through uh, the FBI case, which is completely unrelated to this, but also uh, goes to show that the NCAA is really focusing on um, not punishing players that had nothing to do with, with uh, the wrongdoing that occurred in the past. And this could mean good things for the programs who are currently under investigation, like Kansas, Arizona, LSU moving forward. Obviously we know that the NCAA is very inconsistent in how they, determine uh, punishments. This was actually given by the IARP, which is another form of uh, the hearing uh, that goes along with these NCAA violations. But uh, we will see uh, if uh, these these future cases are treated similarly to Memphis. There are four level one violations, which is a lot. But uh, the fact that Memphis got away without a, a uh, significant punishment, uh, the Memphis lawyers involved deserve a lot of credit for this. They definitely do. I was not hopeful for Memphis, but... Um... I think we're entering the era of like the akin to like the decriminalization of marijuana. It's like, okay, this thing happened. You know, we, we all kind of have some evidence as to what happened and, you know, who was really on the sidelines clamoring for Memphis to get crushed at this point, maybe five years ago, but uh, yeah. Brendan, pleasure having you join us. I know you have some class commitments, so head on out and uh, yeah, always a pleasure having you on the pod. Thank you. Appreciate it. Before, before we get into it, let's do some business. This segment of the podcast is sponsored by the law firm of Orr, Horgan and Flengey. Uh, those are our friends, again, over in Nebraska. Dan, per sources, I might be heading down to Nebraska for a special NIL panel specific to uh, Nebraska athletes. It might be happening. It might also not be happening. Uh, we're going to find in the next couple of days. But, uh, you know, in theory, Dan, this might be my first trip to Nebraska. This is a podcast exclusive. I think that's um, it's about time. I'm an honorary Cornhusker. You're an honorary Cornhusker, and I'm very jealous that you might be going to Cornhusker country. I, th- I think you should make it happen no matter what. I think we have to. Um, but again, uh, if, if I do go, I'll be hanging uh, with my friends, uh, Connor Orr, Thomas Morgan. And uh, yeah, so again, if you, you're in Nebraska looking for legal services on, or even not Nebraska, but looking for help on the athletic side, or Horgan and Flungy, um, that is OHF Law. And uh, tell them we sent you, I'm sure we'll hook you up with something. But yeah, um, I, I, think, I think it's going to happen. It's a long time in the making. Um, uh, so I'm excited. I'm excited. And, and maybe we'll see Nebraska win, which is, Few and far between this year. Dan, I can give you some uh, some New York Cornhusker apparel. As you know, my high school, Yorktown High School in Westchester County, where you are from, is the Cornhuskers. I know that. The Cornhuskers, um, named, you know, after Nebraska. Whoa. My my high school hockey jersey says Cornhuskers in big letters across the front. I'm wow. sure you guys are red. The colors, the colors no, are red. No, we were green. We were green, we were green, black, and white, but uh, it could be. It could I be wouldn't green. mind some like green and yellow, like your corn. That maybe makes more sense than than red. Our, we had, I think, we had a little gold in our uniforms for hockey. I'll, I'll I'll ask my parents if they could dig it out and uh, drive it over to your house in Westchester. Okay, just don't say where I live on the podcast. But um, <laughs> so uh, let's stand on this. This one came across my radar as a as a fun one, and certainly I appreciate it. Uh, I might be rocking. I have a lot of pure Nebraska gear. So I might kind of contractually be obligated to wear all the stuff that has been sent to me by Cornhusker fans over the past two years, which is not a normal thing to say, but then again, neither is being an honorary Cornhusker. So uh, I guess I got to wear it. Um, so this one, Dan, um, I, I uh, usually I see these things when they first come out. I totally missed this one. But here's the story, right? Uh, the South Carolina Gamecocks. When I grew up, uh, you know, Dan, Dan, did you ever go to the Westchester mall back in the day? Of course I did. It was a store, which is a popular store across the country, but it was my favorite store at the Westchester Mall, a store called Lids. Uh, it had the best hats, right? They had like New Era hats, all these different hats. Yep. And, uh, you know, when I was younger, I went into the store and they had a South Carolina Gamecocks hat. 
but it didn't say Gamecocks. It just said Cox, which I thought was really funny. And I thought I could get away with it because that is the nickname for the Gamecocks. So that is where uh, this version of Sports Law takes us to uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, one of my cousins went there, Stephanie Weisenberger, who's on the podcast from time to time, also went there. So here's the story, Dan. And before I get into the, the fun legal stuff, do you know what a Gamecock is? I had to, I had to do some research here. Dan, it's actually really funny that you mentioned your story from high school because I also did the same thing where I went to Lids at the Jefferson Valley Mall, oh. also in Westchester, um, got a Gamecocks hat that said Cox, thinking I was really funny, 16 wow. um, Great minds. Great Dan's think alike. Not just you, not just myself and Dan Wallach. Dan Green's down in the club. Yeah, it's either that or we have terrible teenage sense of humors. And I thought that well, was... Well, hold on. We're, we're going we're gonna to lean right into this. This is where the story's going to take us. Well, Dan, the Gamecock, right, is, a, uh, is essentially a rooster that's trained for uh, a legal... Uh, cockfighting right it's the actual legal term that's what it is and i when i looked that up and i'm like that is the mascot for south carolina a rooster that is trained for fights um okay i guess it is what it is i guess that word is a legal word that we can say on this podcast fine so dan it, it is a bizarre story so 1999 there's a family that raises roosters and they go to the uh the south carolina they're alums of the school uh for purpose of the story uh it's uh out Al, Al, the names are albert telly and snelling it's a husband and wife um, but I'll just call him Albertelli for, for purpose of this. So the Albertelli family, they get a, uh, they went some charity auction and get a dinner with the college baseball coach of South Carolina. I'm like, Hey, by the way, while we have you at dinner, we've got uh, this little Gamecock here. And maybe this could be the official mascot of the school. Like all these other schools have mascots like university of Texas has Bebo and uh, Uga, the, the dog at, at Georgia. Like we should have a Gamecock. And the baseball coach says like, as long as this thing, and I was reading this long ESPN piece, but, uh, they basically said, as long as it doesn't go on the field, it's fine. Just have it on the dugout, have it dancing around. So, um, Dan, your first pop quiz in this. Um, do you know the name of this initial this initial Gamecock? It's actually a great name. Oh, is this is this, this one I've named after Coach Lou Holtz? Yes. Oh, uh, the name eludes me, but I knew it had something to do with Lou Holtz. This is a story very much about the name of the Gamecock. So this will be a, a, a constant theme through this story, but it was named Cockadoodle Lou. So uh, that was 1999. The baseball team does pretty well over the next couple of years with this dancing Gamecock. Uh, and then uh, it makes its way through the football program, basketball. And then the thing is like now a, a version of like Sister Jean. Like, like you just see, uh, what is Sister Jean? Is it Loyola? Is that the school? Before I yeah, Loyola, well, Chicago. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing. They have this, this live Gamecock. So at some point, um, Albert Telly and Snelling, they're not getting paid by the university to bring this uh, rooster or Gamecock. Hopefully that's not slander by calling it a rooster. But, uh, you know, they're not getting paid any money, uh, but they do hire a lawyer and they do get the trademark uh, rights for the name. Uh, it is Big, Big, sorry, Sir, let me, let me do it again. So the name is Sir Big Spur, and that's the name of this Gamecock. So we're, we're lawyers here. We're talking about the legal side. They're not getting paid any compensation from the school. Maybe they're getting reimbursed from travel expenses. But they do have the intellectual property for the name Sir Big Spur. So over the course of the years, uh, there's no issues. There's Sir Big Spur 1. Two, three, four, five, six. I guess one's retiring or passing away, and they're replacing with a new one. So this uh, Albert Telly family is like, okay, uh, you know, this is kind of fun going to our alma mater. But we're getting old. Uh, we want to. It's kind of a pain in the ass to bring this, uh, you know, chicken around or rooster around to all these games. We want to start phasing out. So this is where stuff gets interesting, Dan. Um, Dan, jump in at any moment. How, are you? Am I the only one that's fascinated by the story? No, I mean, it, it came across my radar late, too. And uh, anything with live mascots is always uh, is always of interest to me. I've always I've always been a fan of the uh, of Bebo at Texas and uh, of any of any live dog mascot. That's uh, that's usually my favorite. I was hoping that there'd be some sort of skating dog in the hockey world, but I have not seen one yet. It, there might be, but you might have to Google the fight between uh, Bebo and Uga. That happened once. Yes, I have seen that. It's a great, great video. I think uh, I did a one, once upon a time an assumption of the risk video that was put a bull and a dog uh, wearing red next to each other. Assumption of the risk. And uh, yeah. Ugo almost died on that day. So yeah, unfortunately. Pretty much assumption of the risk. Um, but anyway, so for story purposes, uh, I'll try to keep this part tight, but this is where the legal stuff gets in. The name is Sir Big Spur, one through six. They, uh, the Albert Telly family owns that uh, name. They've trademarked it. They've hired some fancy lawyer in South Carolina. And they allowed South Carolina the, the license to use that name. So they could advertise Sir Big Spur, right? Um, so meanwhile, um, you know, probably with the permission of South Carolina, Albert Telly's like, we want to retire. We want to give this over to some other family that also has uh, roosters and game docks. And 
we, we want the lem to take over the, the handling duties and we'll fade into the background, but we still want to own the name. So this family, the Clarks, they take over. For the first year, Sir Big Spur 6 is still alive and it's the Albertelli's Gamecock. No big deal. They're just holding someone else's Gamecock. So the problem is, Dan, Sir Big Spur dies. Okay, Sir Big Spur 6 dies. It needs to be replaced. But now the Clarks are in charge. Albertelli's not in charge. And the Clarks are like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to mix this thing up. We're going to put a traditional Gamecock with that little, uh, they call it a red cone, like a little, uh, it's like a yeah. shark fin on the top of that little flappy thing, like a turkey has. And they go, for the first time in uh, Sir Big Spur history, ours is going to have the traditional look of the rooster. So Albert Telly's like, whoa, hold on. We said you could handle it. We thought that you meant that nature of the, uh, the same kind of rooster that we've been using. Big fight. OK, uh, so they have her falling out. They're still controlling the, the rooster situation. But Albert Telly and controls the trademarks. So August 1st, 2022, very recently, they called up South Carolina. And they go, hey, uh, I know the Clark problem. You know, you, you like those guys. We used to like them. You're not allowed to call it Sir Big Spur anymore. So this, Dan, is where we're uh, I was about to say S hits the fan. But we're saying the word uh, saying Gamecocks and Cox up here. So I'll, I'll, I'll spare us. Uh, <laughs> Were you following the saga? This is the best part of the story. Uh, no, I mean, you and I told, told that briefly earlier, but uh, it, it did not, not, not particularly. Uh, I kind of threw this in you. I, you didn't know how much detail I, I put into the story, but... Uh, it's, anyway, a, it's a great story. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest yeah. of it. Um, so I guess uh, join, join me on this ride here into uh, game, game Cockdom. So the big Sir Big Spur, uh, they say like, we're retiring that name. So then there's like, uh, concern, right? We don't know what the name is going to be. They just know the name is going to be retired. There's a fight between the rooster families. There's a whole nonsense brewing in, in South Carolina. So the school is like, okay, what are we going to do here? They tried to mediate the situation. It wasn't working. And the school, unbeknownst to the public, decides we want to change the name of Sir Big Spur to the general, like the insurance company. It would just be the general. So whatever, be the general one, two, three, however long. And that would be the new name, new lineage. It, has some historical connotations with, uh, you know, American history, but, you know, neither here nor there. There is a local paper in South Carolina that is obviously following the story. And they say, you know, what would you like the new name to be? And they put out an online poll that lists six names. One, they have the, they have the inside scoop. They know the general is being considered. So they put the general on there. They put, I think, uh, Cluck Norris, like they got some good names. The one that was very interesting that is on there, the reason uh, that I, the story I think picked up a lot of traction is Cock Commander. That, that was on the list. So That's I'm like, real. that was pretty kind of weird that they would put that on the list. And then it turns out there is uh, some interesting history on that name. I guess way back when, like 10, 15 years ago, there was a, uh, someone at the South Carolina newspaper was like, there was a picture that was supposed to be on the front page of the newspaper and these like caffeinated Red Bull induced uh, you know, students at two in the morning put a fake headline in like the cock commander is king, like all bow to the cock commander, like yo soy el cock commander. And it was a dummy headline. It was never supposed to go to print. It was just supposed to be held, I guess. And they were going to put a real title on it, but it was a good picture of the mascot. And uh, somebody accidentally hit print. And that was, yeah, that um, that was the the story that, that ran. So Cock Commander has some real lineage in South Carolina. So they put the poll out, this random newspaper, no affiliation to the school. And uh, yeah, Cock Commander gets 80% of the vote. They poll Spencer, they ask Spencer Rattler. He's like, yeah, I love Cock Commander. I love that's the name. And there's this big movement. So uh, eventually they try to, um, I guess, ease everyone's concerns. They're, they're kind of running away. Obviously the name can't be Cock Commander. That's a crazy name for the mascot. And the school's like, we're going to issue a press release. We're going to solve this whole thing, guys. I know you put out that fun poll. No, no, no. The answer is the, the general. And uh, everybody rejected it. Everyone's going crazy. And then, uh, Dan, as, as we as lawyers do, they brought in the Albertellis. They brought in the Clarks. They brought in South Carolina. And they go, everybody get in the room. Let's mediate this bad boy. And Dan, I'm pleased to report here the new name of the South Carolina mascot. You ready for this? Sure. Sir Big Spur 7. He's back. They worked out a deal. Everyone I know is on the edge of your seats figuring out what's going to happen here. But uh, yeah, because of, Dan, with a, with a hockey assist to, a, I know your favorite sport, with a hockey assist to the cock commander caused so much commotion that uh, there was an issue that was reached by alums, obviously, of the school. They can't have the cock commander floating out. Spencer Rattler, 
quarterback of the team endorsing a name that is clearly not an appropriate name for any other podcast other than this one. We, we are grandfathered in. But yeah, definitely a bizarre, bizarre IP lawsuit in the middle of a mascot lawsuit, in the middle of an animal lawsuit, mediation involved. So obviously, obviously we have to cover it. People take their mascots very, very seriously, and especially how they're portrayed. I know there's a big divide here in Syracuse between regular auto and then angry auto on apparel. I'm more towards regular auto. Auto's the fuzzy orange ball, right? He's an orange. <laughs> like, oh. but it's like the fruit um, with arms and legs and hats. Perfectly normal. But there, you know, on certain shirts and other apparel, there's like an angry, kind of fired up version of of Otto. And some people like that. But people take their mascots very, very seriously, as we as we just learned um, in this story. Yes. Uh, and it reminds me of another interesting one where the Oregon duck, who was nice and friendly and fluffy, became like a really angry, anthropomorphic, uh, like spandexed uh, duck. So, yeah, it's happened before. But this one resulted in litigation. So obviously, obviously I have to cover it. I think that's a good place to end it. Um, I alluded to it on the last episode. Uh, if you follow uh, us on social, I don't think you could miss it. Uh, I am starting a new job this week at the law firm of Mord, Hawk and Hamroff. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll say uh, you guys can check out my bio. Um, but uh yeah, it's a fun move. I'm sure we can talk. We'll talk about it. At some point, we'll talk about the story of how it all came to be, but all good things. Uh, and yeah, very excited. So, uh, Dan, yeah, looking forward to working with you on some more sports cases, maybe some referrals back and forth. Maybe we can make this thing happen. Sounds good to me, man. Yeah. Re- referrals. If you have friends in the sports law space, referrals are the best way to, to help your friends out. So, Dan, uh, I think I think we there might there might be one for you and I to work on. It's something that came across my radar, but we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it offline. Oh, sure. I see. I see your face lighting up. Yes. Sound, sounds good Business. to me. I mean, you got downstate, I got upstate or central New York, whatever. Another big argument around here, whether it's upstate yeah. New York or central New York, but. Yeah, with the transactional world, our, our world is our oyster. I'm now, I guess the main thing is I'm moving from a pure litigation role to more of a transactional. So you can do a deal in any state in the country. Choice of law provisions are, are, are very fun, but uh, yeah, so it's a, a new world here for sure. That's um. Right. Yeah. So Dan, um, you know, uh, again, people can find you uh, on, on their company website, Newman and Lickstein. Dan, tell people where they can find you elsewhere. Yeah. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm under Daniel S green with the E at the end of green. I am also on Twitter, uh, Dan green with the E one five. I know it's a pretty boring Twitter handle, but um, that's what it is. I've had it for almost 10 years now, so I'm not going to change it. Yeah, I also do guest lectures around um, Central New York um, and whoever else wants to have me come in and do stuff. I was at Syracuse Law School. I'm doing the business school next week, SUNY Cortland. And uh, we were at Temple Law School together. So you, you we, go across state lines, Dan. We were at Temple, hey, and if anybody wants to go somewhere that's, you know, warm and sunny, I'm, I'm happy to find a way over there as well. Mm-mm-mm. Dan, uh, always a pleasure having you on a former, uh, you know, current Union College alum, but former student or former classmate of mine at Union once upon a time. So yeah, all good, Dan. Thank you for joining us here on the pod. Before we end the episode this week, it has become uh, a new tradition here. It's the Better Edge segment where Conlon comes on, he gives us a pick, I tell him it's wrong, and it wins. Mr. 2-0, Mr. Undefeated Conlon Farrell, welcome back. You have the floor because you keep winning. Listen, Dan Lust, you always like to remind me I'm not a lawyer. and No, I'm not. But what I am is a winner. 2-0, and back-to-back weeks, cashing tickets. And let's keep that train rolling. Let's move down to Magic City, Hot Atlanta, where this week the Atlanta Falcons will play host to the Cleveland Browns, coming in as actually a two-and-a-half-point underdog, the home Falcons. That's where I'm going. Atlanta Falcons, two-and-a-half-point underdogs at home. Listen, they've been competitive in all three games they've played so far, picking up their first win of the season last week against Seattle. Um, listen, this game is going to be a battle of attrition. Both teams in the top five and rushing this season. Where I look to see is who's actually healthier, and that would be the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, the Cleveland Browns having a whopping 11 guys on this week's injury report, including Miles Garrett, who obviously got thrown the uh, banana peel like they have in Mario Kart, and unfortunately it was in a little bit of a wreck. Thank God he's okay, but he was a little banged up. And uh, so, look, I like to see the Atlanta Falcons here, reigning NFC Offensive Player of the Week, Cordell Patterson. Deliver. Give me the Atlanta Falcons at plus two and a half at the Mercedes Benz Dome this Sunday. Colin, that was very good. Uh, the only conditions for you to keep preparing on the on the podcast are a pick winners and mm-hmm. b uh, bring the energy and uh, the banana peel car accident. Um, you know, uh, cer- certainly some energy. So, Colin, listen, you you've come. I want to give you your flowers. 
Detroit Lions week one, Dallas Cowboys week two. Both bets weren't particularly close. No one really had to sweat it out. Nope. So, uh, yeah, uh, let's uh, take that betting ticket to the window and uh, appreciate it. So, again, segment sponsored by Better Edge. They are uh, basically a, a peer-to-peer sports betting site. So there is no house. That means either Colin, you or I, if we bet against each other, someone has to win. So if you don't want the house to win, you go to a site like Better Edge. And, uh, yeah, $20 if we use our promo code CONDUCT. That is the place where we want to you to do your betting. Colin, great job, buddy. Uh, thanks a lot, Dan. Be back next week. Another winner. So, Colin, uh, I guess I guess that's a good place to end the show. For people uh, looking for more for Conic Detrimental, head to conicdetrimental.com. For myself, Colin, Brendan Bell, Dan Green, and all of us here at the Conic Detrimental family, we'll see you next time on another episode of Conic Detrimental.